Are you able to share your screen? Uh, yes, I am. Yeah, I'm good. All righty. In that case, I will just pull up my uh, my introduction, and I guess we're a, a minute or so. Um, yeah, now is probably a a good time to to start. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Davis, for uh, for giving the the final closing keynote for the uh, for the conference. It's been an absolutely wonderful couple of days of uh, multiple, so many different ways of thinking about the the manuscript and the uh, traditions associated with it, and uh, and so on. So, uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Fagan Davis, who received her PhD in medieval studies from Yale University in 1993. In addition to authoring several monographs and numerous articles about medieval manuscripts, she has cat catalogued medieval manuscript collections at Yale University, University of Pennsylvania, the Walters Art Museum, Wellesley College, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Boston Public Library, and several pri private collections. In 2016, she co-curated the major expedition Beyond Words, Illuminated Manuscripts in Boston Collections at the Houghton Library at Harvard University, the McMullen Museum of Art in Boston College, and the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Dr. Davis has taught Latin paleography at Yale University and regularly teaches an introduction to manuscript studies at the Simmons University School of Library and Information Science. She was elected to the Comité International de Paléographie Latine in 2019 and has served as Executive Director of the Medieval Academy of America since 2013. She's currently undertaking a detailed paleographical study of the Voynich Manuscript, Yale University Beinecke Rare Books and Manuscript Library, Manuscript 408. So without further ado, let me hand over to Dr. Davis for um, her presentation. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, and thank you for uh, to everyone for your um, papers in the last few days. It has really been such a, such a pleasure to hear from all of you, to learn from all of you. Uh, and that goes also for my collaborators in all of this, Colin and Claire and John and Monica and uh, everyone on the on the Malta Voynich team. And I've learned so much from working with all of you. And thank you to everyone for being here. After listening to all of the lectures over the last two days, it is clear to me that even though significant progress is being made, Voynichologists continue to disagree about some of the most important and fundamental questions about the manuscript. How many letter forms are there? How many scribes can we identify? Are there ligature, ligatures, majuscules, abbreviations, and other scribal conventions? These questions have never been satisfactorily answered. As we bring Voynich 2022 to a close, I will address some of these lingering questions by presenting the results of a formal paleographic analysis of the Voynich manuscript using the methodologies of Latin paleography. Throughout this paper, I will be referring to Voynich's glyphs by their EVA names and will be using statistics gleaned from Rene Zanbergen's IVTFF transcription files. As we all know by now, in the 1970s, Captain Prescott Courier discerned two primary hands at work in the first, the botanical section of the manuscript, scribe one shown on the right and scribe two on the left noting a direct correlation between what he called language A and scribe one and language B and scribe two. And as we've seen, these distinctions are constantly being refined and challenged. The distinction between scribe one and scribe two is quite clear. Here, for example, scribe two and scribe one are easily distinguishable on consecutive pages, facing pages 31V and 32R. The scribe two on the left and scribe one on the right. The hands look quite different from one another, with scribe one widely and evenly written and spaced, and scribe two hurried and crowded with a distinct upward cant to the line of writing. Courier attempted to identify the hands elsewhere in the manuscript, but his work beyond the botanical section is incomplete, half-hearted, and somewhat unconvincing. No trained paleographer or codicologist had revisited the relationship between scribes, dialects, and structure in the Voynich manuscript since Courier publicized his observations in the 1970s. Courier himself once said that he wasn't entirely certain about his conclusions 
and that the problem required the attention of a trained paleographer. My colleague Rene Zandbergen has also put out the call on his website for an expert paleographer to address the question of scripts and scribes. Hence my present project, undertaken by a trained medieval paleographer and codicologist. The discipline of paleography involves three skill sets. Literacy, learning how to read letter forms and expand abbreviations in different scripts. Attribution, the uh, understanding the history of a particular style of script in order to establish the date and place of origin. And three, description, studying graphic features of letter forms as well as general script characteristics in order to classify and distinguish different scribal hands. As far as the Voynich is concerned, of course, number one cannot yet be accomplished since no one can read the manuscript yet. As for number two attribution, we cannot compare the glyph set to other examples because there aren't any. The best we can do is to try and contextualize the glyph set by comparing the letter forms to other manuscripts as we saw earlier today from Claire and Katie. This early humanistic manuscript at the Huntington Library in California is a nice example. As many of the Voynich letter forms are somewhat analogous to letter forms in this particular codex. Although the early 15th century Italian humanistic origin of the Huntington manuscript is consistent with the carbon 14 dating of the Voynich manuscripts parchment, such correlations are suggestive only, they are not determinative. The humanistic tendencies of the glyph set, the color palette and the style of illustrations, no time to get into that today, do suggest an origin in the early 15th century and a stylistic zone that includes the Italian peninsula, the area around the Aegean excluding Greece and stretching northwards to Germany and parts of Eastern Europe. But what of number three, description? Due to its unique nature, the Voynich presents an interesting paleographical problem from a theoretical as well as a practical perspective. Can the methods and methodologies of Latin paleography be applied to the unique glyph set of the Voynich manuscript? Indeed, they can. Archetype is an open source application that allows users to annotate images with discoverable facets using a customizable data model then search for annotations on, a com on combinations of those facets, pulling the resulting annotations out of their images and into a light box where they can be studied and manipulated. The local archetype instance that I designed for my study of the Voynich glyph set, I called Voynich PAL. Archetype is not an AI engine. It does not analyze the annotations and draw conclusions about them. Rather, it is a tool that allows the human eye to more easily annotate and compare symbols of interest. When applied to the Voynich manuscript, this methodology facilitates the study of individual glyphs, which then allows the identification of which hands wrote on which leaves, which bifolia, which choirs, and which sections, and facilitates an analysis of how and if different scribes collaborated. One of the basic principles of Latin paleography is that at any particular place and time, scribal training and practice results in particular scribal forms, such as letters, numbers, abbreviations, or ligatures, being of particular use for distinguishing between scribes trained in the same region to write the same script. And again, this is something that Claire and Katie demonstrated quite clearly earlier today. Scribes, like careless poker players, have tells. This fundamental principle echoes the principles of modern forensic handwriting analysis, especially as applied to rules governing evidence admissible in court. Neither paleography nor handwriting analysis should be considered sciences. They rely on human expertise and experience. Neither results in absolute certainty, but generates results along a spectrum of surety. My analysis of the scripts and scribes of the Voynich manuscript is a subjective analysis based on my research, my experience, and my expertise. In forensic handwriting analysis, attributes characteristic of the handwriting must first be established, both within the handwriting of the same individual 
and between the handwritings of multiple individuals. This is analogous to the Latin paleographical methodology of determining whether two samples were written by the same scribe or by different scribes. To prepare a handwriting analysis for presentation in a court of law, individuals are asked to write the same word many times. At the same time, the known writing sample is analyzed to determine its distinguishing characteristics, like the collection of two bowl and single bowl A's that Claire and Katie showed us. The known sample is then compared to the collected samples so that the forensic handwriting expert can evaluate the similarities and differences in the known and unknown samples. Forensic handwriting analyst Mark Conger cautions that while differences are a good indication of a non-match, no single similar characteristic, no matter how unique, can determine a match. Therefore, all likenesses must be considered. The examiner must make a judgment in each case by evaluating the totality of the documents. This is a very important point. While I might intuit that the shape of a particular A is sufficient to distinguish or affiliate the mystery sample with others, other features on every page must be considered in order to reach conclusions that can be expressed with confidence. In the United States, forensic handwriting analysis is admissible in court, but it is not considered objective scientific evidence. It is subjective expert testimony with results presented to judge and jury along a spectrum of surety. Identification, which is the highest degree of confidence that two samples were written by the same hand. Strong probability, probable, indications, no conclusion, neutral. Probably did not, strong probability did not, and elimination, the highest degree of confidence that two samples were not written by the same hand. Along these lines, my con conclusions about the scripts and scribes of the Voynich manuscript should not be considered objective scientific analysis. If I were presenting this evidence in a court of law, however, I would express the highest possible confidence in my results based on the evidence and my 30 years of experience and accumulated expertise. As no professional paleographer had yet attempted a comprehensive analysis of the Voynich manuscript and its scripts and scribes, I had to essentially invent a new methodology, Voynich paleography, by applying the lessons I've learned about scribal practice. I began by uploading several dozen leaves into archetype, into Voynich PAL, selecting and annotating images of symbols on each page. Because the scribes on most of the first 56 leaves can be clearly identified as either scribe one or scribe two, it was not necessary to upload all of those images for my initial analysis. A representative sample of leaves written by scribes one and two in the herbal section were uploaded and annotated, along with leaves from all other sections of the manuscript. As I worked my way through the leaves, it gradually became clear that as with Latin scripts, certain symbols, certain glyphs were going to be more useful than others for the initial establishment of criteria. The most common symbols, O, E, and I, for example, did not exhibit any easily identifiable differences from one sample to the next. In general, the more rare the symbol, the more distinctive it is likely to be within the corpus of a particular scribe. The first distinctive symbol I began to focus on was K, two legs, one looped gallows. For the initial analysis of hands, 225 examples of this gallows glyph were annotated on 74 representative pages from throughout the manuscript. The annotations were then sent to the archetype light box for manual sorting and visual analysis. Several features distinguish scribal forms of this glyph. Are there feet at the bottom of either vertical? Are the ascending strokes in fact vertical or are they written at a slight angle? Is the glyph formed by one or two strokes? Is the crossbar bowed or is it horizontal? This is directly related to the previous question since a bowed bar tends to result from the smooth directional change from the top of the first vertical while a horizontal crossbar is the result of lifting the quill after completing the vertical. And finally, is the loop large or small? Is it rounded or is it oval? 
This preliminary analysis identified five hands, the two labeled by courier, scribe one and two, and then three newly identified scribes, which I have cleverly designated scribes three, four, and five. The K character in scribe one is distinguished by a sharp angle at the top of the first vertical as the quill changes direction, a bowed crossbar, a round loop, and a very slight foot at the bottom of the second vertical. Scribe two uses a horizontal straight crossbar indicating a lift of the pen after the completion of the first vertical. It has an oval loop and an upwardly angled final tick. The K written by scribe three is similar to that of scribe one, although slightly more compact. And the K written by scribe four has a horizontal crossbar, a quite oversized loop and a prominent final foot. And scribe five writes a tall, narrow K glyph with a bowed cross stroke that angles out from the very top of the vertical, a very rounded loop and a minuscule tick at the bottom of the second vertical. As with modern forensic handwriting analysis, however, a single character is not sufficient evidence on which to form confident conclusions. So I returned to the entire corpus of symbols on the entire corpus of pages, after which a second, even more determinative glyph was identified, E-V-A-N. The N glyph is almost always at word end and usually preceded by one or two minims or I glyphs, sometimes even three, as we've heard today. Giving the I-I-N or I-N combination that is extremely common at word end. EVA-N is formed by a slanted stroke that mirrors the eye, draw, drawn from the top left to the lower right. The pen then turns to the right and curves up around and back to the left. This final curve, a final flourish, varies significantly from one scribe to the next. In fact, the shape and end point of that final flourish are nearly sufficient to determine scribal identity in the Voynich manuscript, especially when combined with other features. The initial analysis identified the same five scribes as did the study of the K-glyph. Scribe one is distinguished by an N finial that begins at a 90 degree angle from the bottom of the final minimum, looping back high and backwards to end above and to the left of the initial stroke. For scribe two, the angle of origin is much tighter, closer to 45 degrees, and the flourish itself is lower and shorter, ending above the initial stroke. Scribe three uses an even tighter final flourish that nearly closes at the top of the final stroke. The finial written by scribe four is brief and open, finishing above and to the right of the initial stroke. And scribe five ends the end glyph with a long, low finial that finishes well to the left of the initial stroke. After confirming the number of scribes by an analysis of two different glyphs, it was also necessary to test and if justified, refine each scribe's extent of work in the manuscript. To test the scribal identifications, several hundred N annotations were extracted and faceted to create scribal collections, to test the methodology and make refinements as necessary. No outliers were observed in the glyph collections for scribes one, two, and four, leaving the initial folio assignments for those scribes unchanged. Outliers in the scribe three inventory were observed on folio 66 recto, where the long low end finials led to a reattribution of this page to scribe five. I've recently conducted one more analysis to put my attributions to the test, a close examination of the rare F glyph, the one leg, one loop gallows. Scribal tendencies for F are consistent with the scribal corpora identified for K and N. Scribe one pulls the pen slightly to the left at the top of the ascender before cutting to the right for the upper crossbar. Start, um, and the loop is canted at around a 45 degree angle. Scribe two uses a second stroke for the crossbar starting just below the top of the ascender with a fairly vertical loop. Scribe three pulls down and rightwards from the top of the ascender resulting in a slightly bowed crossbar. Scribe four does the same, but with a deeper bow. Finally, scribe five has a bowed crossbar and a small round loop. The identification of the number of scribes and their individual corpora in the Voynich manuscript has important implications for understanding the conditions under which the manuscript was created and for suggesting new directions in linguistic research. 
These scribal assignments also demonstrate how scribal output relates to both codicological and textual structure, revealing the nature of scribal collaboration in the Voynich manuscript. It is impossible to parse the relationship between scribal corpora and the structure of the manuscript without a basic understanding of how medieval manuscripts are put together. Medieval European manuscripts are generally written on paper or parchment. The Voynich manuscript is written on parchment, calfskin to be precise. The species was identified by amino acid sequencing of 10 sample leaves in 2012. After slaughtering in preparation of the skin, the sheet of parchment is cut into rectangular pieces, the size of which would be determined by the desired size of the final manuscript. Generally, the skin of a calf, for example, might yield two sheets for a manuscript the size of the Voynich, although the foldouts are exceptional in size and format. Each sheet is folded in half to create what's called a bifolium, two conjoint or attached leaves known as folios. Each leaf in turn is comprised of two sides or pages. The first side to be read is the recto, the other the verso. Two pages make a leaf, two leaves make a bifolium, and the bifolia are nested together to create a, uh, a gathering or a choir and the choirs are stacked and sewn onto perpendicular cords before being attached to their boards for binding. During the late medieval period to which the Voynich manuscript can likely be attributed, choirs were generally composed of four, five, or six nested by folia, although depending on the needs of the particular codex, choirs might have more or fewer by folia. Codicologists use a formula called a collation to summarize the structure of a manuscript. Here's a fairly simple example that has nothing to do with the Voynich. In this example, the collation tells us the first choir is comprised of eight leaves or four nested by folia, and the second of six, three nested by folia for a total of 14 leaves. Collation formulas are important as they allow researchers to easily understand the structure of a manuscript, the number of leaves, and where leaves may be missing or misbound. The structure of the Voynich manuscript can be expressed using this system as well. In fact, back in the 1930s or so, Anne Nill left herself a note in a small booklet that is now part of the collection at the Grolier Club in New York City, asking herself, where is my collation of the Cypher manuscript? Well, I don't know, Anne, but here's mine. Formula summarizing the current structure of the manuscript. The collation of the Voynich manuscript and the identification of former positions of the known to be missing leaves are greatly facilitated by the survival of choir numbers. Here is Secundus on folio 16V, the end of the second choir, and foliation, here 17 on folio 17R. The choir numbers likely date from an early rebinding if they're not original, and the foliation dates from the 17th century predating the removal of leaves that we know are missing. There may have been leaves removed, of course, before that foliation was added, but there is no way to know for sure. The codex shows evidence of several rebindings, including the current early modern limp vellum, and it seems clear that some of the bifolia were misbound before the foliation was added and likely before the choir marks were added as well. As others have noted, some of the bifolia and single leaf foldouts can be shown to have been reoriented either before the current foliation was added or after the choir marks were written. For, for example, in this well-known example, on the bifolium 78V and 81R, so these are connected to one another, uh, the uh, water spouts on the left center of 78B spill across the gutter to meet the corresponding streams with coordinating ranks of women in pools on the conjoint folio 81 recto, suggesting that this bifolium was originally both, both conjoint and consecutive, serving as the innermost bifolium of its choir, and that it was misordered before the foliation was added. It is currently the second bifolium from the center. In addition, the current configuration of choir nine the foldout comprising folios 67 and 68 can be shown to be a later reorientation as the choir mark is now in the wrong place 
and the sewing holes from the original configuration are still visible in the valley fold on folio 67 versa. This reconfiguration took place after the choirs were numbered, but before the foliation was added. Other interventions took place after the foliation was added, including the loss of at least 14 leaves. These observations are important because they have implications for interpreting the extent of work for each scribe and for understanding how the different scribes collaborated. By overlaying the scribal corpora onto the sections and choirs, this becomes more clear. The Voynich manuscript is traditionally divided into six thematic sections. These are distinct codicological units, although there are several mixed choirs that are almost certainly misbound. This means that we can assign components of the collation statement to each section and to each scribe. The botanical section extends from folios one through 66 and fills the first eight choirs, each of which is or was comprised of four nested bifolia. It was Courier who first observed that in the botanical section, scribes one and two appear on separate bifolia that are mixed together in choirs. In choir four, for example, the innermost bifolium, 28V and 29R shown here, was entirely written by scribe one. The next nested bifolium, which is folios 27 and 30, was also written by scribe one. The next bifolia, 26 and 31, however, was entirely written by scribe two. With the outermost bifolium, 25 and 32, we're back to scribe one. Scribes one, two, and five all make an appearance on separate bifolia in choir six, and this mixing of bifolia continues through the end of choir seven, folio 56. This very unusual collaboration method bears emphasizing the scribal work in the botanical section varies by bifolia, not by page, text, or choir. This is utterly atypical and provides additional evidence that the current sequence of bifolia is not original. Choir eight was originally five bifolia, but only the two outermost are extant. Here we encounter a different method of collaboration. Scribe five writes the two botanical pages on the outer side of the outermost bifolia, 57R and 66V, as well as the text on 66R. Scribe one writes 57V. Scribe three appears for the first time in this choir, writing the entirety of the next bifolium, folios 58 and 65. Scribe four writes the next four choirs, nine through 12, the astronomical and zodiacal foldouts. Choir 13, the balneological section is entirely written by scribe two. Choir 14 is the famed rose foldout with six panels on the obverse written by scribe two and the nine segment rose on the other side written by scribe four. Choir 15 is comprised of two nested foldouts written by scribe one. Both foldout foldouts are likely misbound. The outer foldout is a series of botanical pages that would seem to have been intended for the first section of the manuscript, while the inner bite foldout belongs to the recipe section. The next choir is numbered 17, suggesting that an entire choir is missing after number 15. Choir 17 was originally four nested by folia, but is missing its outer uh, original outer two bifolia. Of the two botanical folia that are left, the outermost was written by scribe one and the innermost by scribe three. Choir 18 is also missing. Choir 19, more recipes, is made up of two nested foldouts written by scribe one. The manuscript ends with the supersized choir 20, originally seven nested by folia, on which are written several hundred starred paragraphs. The innermost bifolium is missing. The entire choir is written by scribe three with the exception of folio 115 recto, where the first 12 lines were written by scribe two. It was Courier who first determined that scribe one writes in what he called language A and that scribe two writes in what he called language B. The other three scribes, three, four, and five also use language B at least according to the tests developed by Courier and refined by others, including Zandbergen. 
as we heard in yesterday's keynote. One of the tests for language A is the frequency of word initial CTH. A test for language B is the frequent use of word final DY, a combination that is exceedingly common in language B, but much less so in language A, and the bigram ED, which shows the same pattern. Another pattern is confirmed by a refinement of Courier's tests. As Renee mentioned in yesterday's keynote, the work of scribe four, language B, can be defined by two additional tests, the relatively small frequency of the QO bigram and the equally small frequency of ED. In other words, in addition to the shape of KN and F, the frequency of QO and ED can help identify the work of scribe four. This additional layer of complexity may indicate, as Torsten Tim and others have suggested, that a reassessment of the distinctions between language A and B might be worthwhile, but such a linguistic analysis is far beyond my expertise and the scope of this lecture. Paleographical methods can also shed light on the even more unusual symbols used in the manuscripts by considering the possibility of the use of abbreviations and ligatures in Voynichese. Abbreviations are quite common in medieval manuscripts. Replacing a sequence of letters with fewer letters or a single symbol with to save space and make the writing process more efficient. A particular scribe's use of abbreviations is entirely discretionary. This is really important. They may choose to abbreviate a particular word in one instance and keep it expanded in another. Ligatures represent a graphic connection of two or more letters as in cursive scripts. In what follows, I will argue that certain classes of Voynich's symbols may be profitably considered to function as abbreviations or ligatures. As a caveat, I will note that while I consider my scribal identifications to be established with the highest degree of confidence, I am less confident about my hypotheses regarding abbreviations and ligatures. For the remainder of this lecture, I will be presenting hypotheses for further consideration rather than absolutely confident assertions. Since serious study of the Voynich began in 1912, many researchers, including uh, Tavi today, have noted the unusual behavior of the four gallows characters, otherwise known as F, P, K, and T. And in what follows, by the way, like everyone else, I am not talking about pedestaled or benched gallows. We're ignoring those for now because their behavior is quite different from plain gallows. We heard some of these observations in Tavi's paper and in others over the last few days. In particular, P and F are overrepresented as paragraph initials and in the top lines of paragraphs. Another extremely important observation is that while the bigrams KE and TE are extremely common, PE is exceedingly rare, almost non-existent, and FE is in fact, non-existent. Some have suggested that these features are cryptographic, that they're clues to the decipherment of the text, or that they may prove that the text was produced artificially. To my eye, as someone who studies the graphic rather than the linguistic properties of script, P and F in top lines are reminiscent of decorative elaborate ascenders, as in this well-known example that's already been mentioned today, from Capelli's Dictionary of Abbreviations, and this bottom line descending example sent to me recently by Beinecke curator Ray Clemens. Now, I know I'm not the first to hypothesize that the gallows that favor top line positioning, the one-legged P and F, may be somehow related to the more common gallows, two-legged T and K. I'm also not the first to note how the classification of gallows by the number of legs and the number of loops suggests pairings that may be significant. Nick Pelling, for example, mentioned this idea in his blog earlier this year, although I'll note that I've been working on this problem from a paleographical perspective for several years now. The natural pairings are P and T with two loops, K and T with two legs, F and K with one loop, and F and P with one leg. The pairings I want to suggest, however, may seem at first to be the most unlikely. F with T and P with K. The overrepresentation of P and F in top lines and the absence of PE and FE can be explained 
if F and P are considered to be abbreviations for TE and KE, respectively. It may seem counterintuitive to affiliate one-legged, one-looped F with two-legged, two-looped T and one-legged, two-looped P with two-legged, one-looped K. Statistically, however, this association resolves several puzzles. As noted above, the bigraphs TE and KE are extremely common, while FE and PE are essentially non-existent. There are only two examples of PE and none of FE. In addition, K is underrepresented in top lines with a frequency of 4.8%. In the entire manuscript, K's frequency is higher, 5.2%. Substituting KE for P corrects this discrepancy, restoring the top line frequency of K to expected values. The T glyph, on the other hand, is not particularly underrepresented in top lines, but because there are so few Fs in the manuscript, the substitution doesn't impact the frequency of T to the same degree. On the other hand, affiliating T with P results in T being significantly overrepresented in top lines. This proposal is also supported by an examination of the contextual evidence. We all know by now that Voynich's has rules, and we've heard a lot of them over the last few days. One of which is that certain bigrams or two-letter pairings are allowed and others are not. In their 2020 article, The Linguistics of the Voynich Manuscript, Bauer and Lindemann, who we've heard from uh, in the last few days, present this chart of observed bigrams with the darkest red indicating the most common pairings. If we examine the contextual usage of TE, KE, F, and P, we find that they are nearly identical. In other words, the glyphs that may follow F and P are the same as those that may follow TE and KE. If we look just at those observed pairings for P and F here in red, we see that the set of glyphs which follows those gallows is the same and is quite limited. So remember, we're not talking about benched gallows, so H is not an option. They may be followed by O, Y, A, C, and S. And while E may be followed by a much larger group of glyphs, T, E, and K, E may not. In particular, some glyphs that are generally allowed to follow E, such as B here, for example, L and R, may not follow E when it is preceded by T or K. For example, E, B is allowable but TEB, KEB, PB, and FB are not. With a few exceptions to be discussed momentarily, the bigram pairings for P and F are nearly the same as triples that begin with TE and KE. Contextually, F, P, TE, and KE are essentially identical. If I am correct that F abbreviates TE, and that P abbreviates KE, expanding these abbreviations in a transcription has important implications for linguistic and computational analyses, as it changes the frequency of T, K, and E, and removes F and P from consideration entirely. For example, the very first word of the manuscript, F-A-C-H-Y-S, would actually be expanded and transcribed as T-E-A-C-H-Y-S. The first word of 116 recto would actually be, instead of K-C-H-D-P-Y, would be K-C-H-D-K-E-Y. Even the number of characters would change, since each instance of P or F would be replaced by two characters. I will leave it to the linguists to investigate what other implications there may be, such as how this idea may affect word frequencies, word pairings, and especially the identification of crib candidates, that is, words identified by linguistic analysis as potentially associated with imagery on a particular page, such as star labels or labels on the recipe pages. For example, in her 2021 master's thesis at the University of Malta, Adriana Camilleri identified multiple crib candidates, including OKLR on folio 72R. The abbreviated version of that word, Opalar, so instead of K-E, we have P, appears on 71 Verso, the facing page, 
perhaps strengthening Camilleri's identification of this word as a crib candidate. There are some corollary rules that would govern these abbreviations. It has often been observed that there are no double gallows in the manuscript. There's one example on 104 verso, but there might be a space between them. This means trigraphs that would result in a double gallows if abbreviated are not allowed. And here's a list of those gallows. And in fact, you do not find those triples in the manuscript. In other words, KE and TE cannot be followed by a gallows character because the abbreviation of that triple would result in a double gallows. For example, KET and TEP would abbreviate to KT and TP respectively. This rule may be related to Julian Brun's observations on his blog about the number of glyphs between gallows, which he finds to generally be more than one. But if the pairs of gallows that are only separated by one glyph, that one glyph is never E. It could be I, Y, or O, for example, but it is never E. Another corollary is that the common triples, TEE -E and KEE, -E, are never abbreviated because FE and PE do not appear in the manuscript. The final corollary has to do with the fact that P and F cannot be followed by D and TE and KE can. In other words, TED and KED are allowed. Not only are they allowed, they're extremely common, but KD and PD are not. For example, coquetti is one of the most common words in the entire manuscript. You might expect then to find multiple examples of the abbreviated version, Q-O-P-D-Y, and yet that occurs only once in the entire manuscript at the top of 75 verso here. The same is true for the common word uh, and suffix oteti. The abbreviated form O-F-D-Y is not found at all. It is true that in Latin manuscripts, there are some words generally of only two or three characters, but not necessarily, that are rarely if ever abbreviated by a particular scribe. And so this practice of selective abbreviation would not be unprecedented. And here I thank Claire for conducting analysis on my behalf of non-abbreviated words across a large corpus of Latin manuscripts. Perhaps these unabbreviated words are stop words or articles like the or an or other words of grammatic significance. I cannot yet explain these corollary behaviors other than by attributing them to an as yet unexplained scribal or linguistic practice. Finally, I have some thoughts about the uh, creatures known as bridge gallows. Although for some of the more complex glyphs, I would classify my certainty level as inconclusive, right in the middle of the certainty scale. I'm presenting these hypotheses today as ideas for further research and collaborative brainstorming. These bridge gallows, rare, graceful, and quite beautiful, have been the cause of much head scratching over the years. I propose, as others have, that it may be possible to interpret them if they're understood as decorative ligatures. Ligatures are graphic combinations between letters, like this 17th century uncial, en, and er, or these 15th century humanistic examples. Even the ampersand used today is a ligature, not an abbreviation, originally representing a combination of e and t for the Latin word at. What I propose here is a system for parsing bridge and other complex glyphs as ligatures connecting gallows that are near one another. This idea may help to clarify many of the uncertain EVA readings and re related linguistic and computational an analyses. Let's start with the most common bridge gallows and the least complex. This bridge gallows occurs seven times in the manuscript, connecting two benched gallows that are near one another in the top line, each of which appears to be CTH. The two words bridged by this ligature on folio 8 recto, for example, could likely be parsed as CTHO and CTHEY, both of which are legitimate Voynich's words. This one on folio 107B could be parsed like this, which I will not try to pronounce because it is unpronounceable and I have axlagomman, 
But as we know, there are lots of those. So that is certainly not an impediment. Another simple bridge gallows is this one on 56R, which interpreted as two Ts would be read like this. As the bridge gallows become more complex with multiple loops and legs, parsing them becomes more complex as well. By counting the number of loops and legs, it may be possible to unpack these ligatures into their constituent parts. For example, this bridge gallows star label on 68R2 is comprised of three loops and three legs. And so in the system that I propose, this bridge's constituent parts should together comprise three loops and three legs. Furthermore, whichever gallows comes is first between the two O's has a loop on its left side, which means it might be either, or should be either P or T. So that's two of our three loops right there. The second gallows then would have to be F or K with only one loop. The combination can't be F and P because together they have only two legs. F, P, and K works, giving us three loops and three legs. The other option is T and F, again resulting in three loops and three legs. So the expanded label would be either what we see here at the top or the second line. And if P indeed equals KE, we can expand it further, expand the first word into OK all as opposed to the other option, OTAL. Let's do one more. This one is found in the Northeast compartment of the Rose Foldout, just above the structure with the lovely Swallowtail Merlins. In this case, we count three legs, but only two loops. The left-hand gallows has no loop, so it must be one of the single loop gallows, that is F or K. In order to comprise the right number of legs and loops, K must be paired with F in this case, and F would have to be paired with K. Those are the only options that give you the right number of legs and loops. The potential readings then would be these two words. The F in the second option can then be expanded to TE. It is to be hoped that these ideas will be useful to all voynichologists, whether they're linguists, cryptologists, botanists, or historians. We have all learned so much from our colleagues in these last few days, but there are still many fundamental things we don't know about the Voynich manuscript. On the one hand, there are some things we can place fairly high on our certainty scale. The approximate date of origin in the early 15th century, the scribal use of varying orthographic patterns, the provenance, the codicological structure. To these, we can now add the number of scribes and an understanding of the collaborative nature of the manuscripts creation. Any potential solution or reading of the Voynich manuscript should take such observations into account, combining them with an evidence-based interpretation of the text and images, all of which must be consistent with the material and historical evidence. Only by accounting for all of the evidence, paleographical, codicological, linguistic, illustrative, historical, and material, can we successfully unravel the enigma that is the Voynich manuscript. Thank you very much. I will be very happy to take uh, to take questions, but I think I will stop sharing. Uh, shall I just jump in there, Claire? Let's see. Um, sure. Yeah, we have uh, a number of questions in in the Q and A. We also have a couple in the chat from panelists. Um, Renee had a question about uh, the set of uh, the five cutouts numbered one to five earlier in the talk whether they were the same scale so that ca like can we draw conclusions about the relative sizes of glyphs and line spacing uh, that scribes might uh, might use uh so the the sort of in terms of the the what paleographers use a, a 10 line measure uh for scribal output there's not a huge difference between them. Scribe one is much more widely spaced, but otherwise they're they're quite um, they're quite similar. Uh, I see J. Marcy Begleiter says, "Do you have any thoughts about the drawings in terms of single or multiple illustrators?" That is a great question, and it is the next on my list. I have been starting to look at um, different. It's difficult to figure out particular 
features that might distinguish them, whether it's the way they draw a nose or how they draw their stars. I'm still working on that, but I, I, it may be possible, but I don't know, I don't know yet for sure. Uh, Ken asks, would it be fair to say that uh, Scribe One is the most easily recognizable? Oh, absolutely. Um, and if so, this would mean that the scribe who uses the most distinct writing style is also the one who uses Courier A, while the more similar scribes use Courier B. What could explain this? That's the $10,000 question, right? No, who knows? I, I, I couldn't tell you. That's a, that's a linguistics question. That's, that's a question for Claire, not, not for me. Um, Claire, do you have thoughts about that? Oh, um, many, many thoughts, but I don't want to... <laughs> Uh, mooch over onto your question period but I, I guess I let me throw it back to you from a paleographic standpoint could it be that um, the less distinct or the more similar scribes learnt from each other um, or could they yeah, yeah absolutely and, and in fact I, I wrote in my article and you know this is very very hypothetical the collaborations that we see between uh, with scribe three, with scribe four, and with scribe five, when we see an intersection with other scribes, it's generally with scribe two. And that may suggest that scribe two was sort of the, the brain behind the whole enterprise, was somehow responsible for the whole thing. Who knows? I, you know, I just don't know. Uh, Rich Santa Coloma asks, considering that the overwhelming majority of pre-radiocarbon dating, whoop, where did, there it is. Question, uh, testing experts dated the Voynich later decades or even centuries than the carbon 14 results showed. How influential was that dating on your opinions about the script? Oh, the script and the illustrations absolutely look to me like early 15th century. Uh, you know, I, I would, that's where I would have put it absolutely without, um, you know, the, the color palette, the style of the script. It has, it has a humanistic feeling to it. Uh, I would absolutely have put it in the early 15th century, no matter what. Uh, let's see, Tavi says, agree with comparing K to P rather than T to P. I noticed that was on one of your slides uh, and that the range of glyphs following K, E, and P are similar, but is there a problem about relative proportions? P, C, H is very common and K, E, C, H, while possible is not. So, you know, I mean, the, the get out of jail free card for all of this is that abbreviations are not mandatory, right? They're always selective. They're always, and scribes are always making choices. Uh, and so, you know, whether something is abbreviated or not is really a, a choice that scribes make. Um, but I, I would be really interested to hear, Tavi, how your own research might be impacted by this idea. Uh, let's see, Daniel Gaskell says, is it possible to distinguish between different scribes and one scribe whose handwriting changes subtly over time? So generally speaking, even if you change your handwriting over time, the way that you draw things, the way you write characters is gonna be consistent. So um, for example, I always, when I write the letter O, I start at the top center and go around counterclockwise. That's how I'm always gonna do it, no matter what, no matter how old I am. I've been doing that since I was eight years old or five years old, you know? So you expect that there are, the general characteristics of your hand might change, you know, if you develop a tremor or you just become, <laughs> become sloppier, but the underlying way that you draw, the way your hand moves is, is gonna be consistent uh, over time. Uh, Jean-Marie says, what about folio 116R? I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean 116V? Um, I'm not sure. Is it possible? All right, let me, let me move on uh, waiting for a clarification there. Is it possible to detect scribal errors? Oh, sure. Uh, in fact, um, scribe one makes a lot of mistakes, uh, meaning that there are a lot of um what look like missteps in the work of, of scribe one. So as others have been noting for a hundred years now, there aren't scratch out, there aren't erasures, but there are what look to be mistakes uh, throughout the manuscript, but a scribe one has a, has a lot of them. 
Uh, and let's see, Harold Anderson, did you apply a methodology looking for longer abbreviations as we see in Latin paleography? Uh, no, um, I the KEPE -E was the one that that jumps out as being the most um, obvious uh, in terms in terms of statistics, just a statistical analysis. I am starting to put some thought into what's happening with CFH and CPH. I, you know, I just, I don't know. I haven't dug enough into their behavior and I don't know enough about their behavior. And uh, again, I'm not a linguist, so I, I'm really cautious about doing that kind of analytics. And that's why I'm collaborating with all of these uh, wonderful people. Uh, Jean-Marie says, yes, I meant folio 116V. Folio 116V is almost certainly written later than the manuscript. It appears to me to be from the late 15th century, so uh, I'm not considering it at all. Uh, Siv says, is it possible for you to know if there are different language or dialects, uh, if different scribes use the glyphs differently? Uh, that is, again, not my wheelhouse. That's a, that's a question for the linguists and the computational uh, analytics folks. Nick says, isn't it hard to reconcile scribal abbreviations as it is syncratic? Um, it seems to is more of a systematic thing than an arbitrary thing. Uh, I'm, hmm, I'm not sure that I understand what you're saying. I'm not sure I understand your, your concern, Nick. Um, I would, I guess, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, if you, Yes, please try again. Uh, and one, and in the meantime, Darren says, why are there no corrections in the manuscript? Well, there are lots of manuscripts that don't have corrections. I mean, that's, you know, people point that out as being somehow proof that it was artificially created, that it's a hoax, that it's fake. It's a, there are lots of manuscripts that um, that are, that have no obvious corrections. That, you know, that I don't, I don't strike that. I don't see that as concerning. Um, let's see. Lisa, Richard I can add says, a little bit to, to that while the, uh, yeah, while please. Is retyping his yeah. question, um, because that was another one of the experiments I did with the uh, students in my class a couple of years ago. I got them to copy a language that had characters that were similar to what they knew. And, um, I can't remember exactly what I use now, but it had a number of digraphs and, uh, and so on. And it was basically impossible for them to, simply copy a manuscript without making errors and without automatically correcting their errors. Um, now, I don't want to uh, make too many generalizations about 21st first century people's experiences with literacy compared to 15th century um, uh, authors and scribes and so on, but that was quite surprising and perhaps suggestive that it's a, it's a trained skill um, as well. Yeah, uh, so, um, oh, there's Nick. FTE and PKE would seem to be a systematic change to obfuscate the top line statistics rather than an arbitrary scribal choice. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, it depends on whether you think of Voynich's as obfuscating or rather it, you know, it, it, it all comes back to whether you think that the manuscript is encrypted or, it, you know, it could be a trans, a transcription of a spoken language that doesn't exist anymore. Um, I don't have an opinion about that. Um, and so I would not comment on that. I am I am not here to make a determination about whether the manuscript is encoded or a transcription or meaningful or meaningless. That is not my wheelhouse. I have been staying in my lane. I have my own expertise and that's why I'm collaborating with linguists and computational people who do computational analytics. That might be a good point to um, to end on. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Davis, for sharing your um, amazing expertise uh, with us. And um, I'm going to hand over now to Colin Layfield, who's going to close the conference. But before I do that, I just would like everyone to give a, I guess, silent but local round of applause to Colin for organizing such a fantastic conference over the last uh, couple of days. Uh, Snaps right, so to Colin. And yeah. thank you so much, Claire. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I'd invite John, Lonica, and all the other panelists to turn their cameras on. They should get their moment of fame as we close off. It's a team effort. It's not just me. Uh, let's uh, 
add some additional spotlights here. John? We need a we need a, a group portrait. Renee and John, turn your cameras on. There we go. And John, are you there? All right. Well, John's here in spirit. <laughs> John's here in spirit. Anyways, uh, wow, great talk, Lisa. I really don't know how I'm supposed to follow her, but I'll try. Um, we've had a couple of days of, of good presentations, good talks. Um, I guess my role is to thank everyone who contributed. I mean, the program committee, again, um, they vetted everything and had the, the owner's task of trying to decide what got by and what didn't, which is not an easy task as any academic knows reviewing papers is it can be challenging sometimes um i'd like to thank obviously the presenters our keynotes renee lisa and ray for opening the conference and of course our presenters that made up the substance of what we had to show over the last two days and of course everyone here who attended i mean without an audience there's no conference so a big thank you for everyone who showed an interest in this and some of the excellent questions I've seen um, flying uh, through the Q&A section. It's hard to keep up sometimes. Um, so that's really all I have to say, unless somebody has something to add. I, I think I think we're done here. Who knows? Maybe maybe we'll do this again in a few years. Uh, you, the attendees could expect, I'm planning on sending out a, a sort of a survey as to what people thought of uh, the conference and how it went down. And oh, and the, don't forget to tell people about the proceedings. Yes, I, I'm looking at publishing the proceedings online. There's an organization I'm working with, so that might take a few weeks for me to sort out, but all the papers should be available publicly at some point. And the the authors who gave permission to share the videos, I'll make those available at some point in the future also. So you're not left hanging dry wondering what these people said, you'll be able to read it yourself in due course. And with a bit of luck, maybe, maybe we'll do this again in a few years. We'll see. We'll do it the feedback says. So thank you very much for attending. And I wish you a good evening or morning, depending on where you are. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here.